the dancers, the musicians, the scientists, it's fabulous. Okay, so uh, we have four people. I think the order is Dennis, Suman, Marv, and then Marge. Does that work for everybody? Presenting, okay, so Dennis, you wanna get started? And again, uh, this is being webcast. The default is that it will be webcast. Uh, if you would not like to um, have your presentation um, be live, then please let's tell the operator in the back. Good morning. I'm uh, Dennis Sampson uh, with the Utah Education Network. I'm an associate director in the administration and I'm uh, happy to be here. I thought that was a wonderful demonstration of uh, advanced technologies and, and what's happening in the research community last night and thrilled to go back and tell my colleagues back at uh, UEN uh, what an amazing uh, uh, event this has been. I uh, wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the research and education that's happening with UEN, the University of Utah, and Utopia. Uh, Todd Marriott, the Executive Director of Utopia, is also going to uh, present with me this morning and talk to you a little bit about uh, our partnership and work that we're doing with uh, Advanced Networking. So we've been working with uh, Professor Rob uh, Ricci at the University of Utah in the Flux, uh, Re Flux Research Computing Group. And uh, we've collaborated with the research community at UEN for quite some time, uh, successfully for many years. Uh, this slide I brought up to shows you that Salt Lake City is really the crossroads of uh, fiber infrastructure in the western United States. Uh, UEN works with a lot of the research community in neighboring states like the I Iron uh, Network, the Idaho Re Regional Optical Network. Um, all the way up to the Northwest, Northwest Gigapop. And uh, one of the exciting projects that we're working on with the university is uh, opening a new downtown data center in early 2012 uh, with assistance from EPSCOR grants and BTOP grants. Uh, UEN was a BTOP grant recipient this past year. We're going to be building a new fiber infrastructure uh, in our state uh, to assist the research institutions in uh, their computing and research initiatives. Um, we're also working with some broader initiatives uh, with uh, national and regional efforts with Internet to the USU UCAN project. A little bit about UEN. We manage a statewide network uh, that's comprised of over 1,400 uh, community anchor institutions, uh, high schools, colleges, middle schools, elementary schools, a lot of the public libraries. And then we're also building out our network to uh, pre-K uh, centers like Head Start centers that assist uh, disadvantaged families. Uh, in our BTOP project, we are also building out an additional 150 community anchor sites uh, in about 180 miles of fiber uh, in underserved and unserved areas of Utah. And you can see we actually really have a lot of fiber infrastructure working with independent, our independent telecom partners um, across the state and so in very remote areas of the state we actually have gigabit connectivity to assist in some of the research uh, initiatives that um, regardless of the uh, population where they live uh, we can uh, deliver distance education and those resources to that, those populations. Uh, this is just give you a county level illustration of kind of what UEN's network is. You'll see in the center there is Utah Valley University. We have a 10 gigabit uh, core backbone uh, in a north ring and a south ring. And, and so U UVU is the major POP institution. From, a, from the POP institution, we have built out fiber infrastructure to our school districts and then also extended that fiber infrastructure out to the local K-12 schools. So it's exciting. I think within the next two to three years, we will actually have for every uh, public case 12 school in Utah, um, they'll have at least a 100 megabit connection or greater. 
Uh, one of the projects we've been working with with the University of Utah is called MULAB, and probably some of you in this room have been working with our Flux Computing Group at the University and Rob Ricci on this project. Um, it's one of the core pieces of infrastructure for the research community. Uh, MULAB provides a way for researchers to evaluate new network applications, and it provides a lab for controlled, uh, re repeatable experiments, and integrates a number of technologies, wireless and wired. <coughs> And Emulab's users uh, are all across the country. Uh, the university's been developing Emulab for, I think, at least 10 years. Uh, in working with uh, NSF, uh, the university has been evolving Emulab into the Protogenie de deployment. Uh, Protogenie is a general purpose framework for building research infrastructure resources that are geographically distributed, uh, owned by different users at different colleges and, and universities, and then embedded into the production network. And so our research group, this is just a screenshot of some of the research that's been conducted using Protogenie. Um, it's the interface, you can kind of see the interface there to bring up these uh, distributed networks across the country. Uh, I understand the group of projects in Protogenie is one of the largest, if not the largest, contributing members to uh, in the Genie ecosystem. So really, together with the University of Utah and UEN, uh, working together, uh, we have technologies and bandwidth to run the applications in the lab <coughs> environments and transition those into research, into uh, embedded production networks, and then really roll them out into full deployment. So a couple examples for US Ignite you know, we've been talking about are US kind of early warning services built into the network, uh, location aware, real-time dissemination of information to the public in emergency situations. Give you an example, a couple years ago we had a gas leak on our campus where we were all notified to evacuate, uh, not given specific instructions on where to go or how to get out of the campus, uh, obviously it created a mass of people trying to get out of, of one place. Uh, in talking to uh, Professor Ricci, he was relating the idea of maybe be able to give people real-time instructions depending on your location and what kind of incident is happening on campus that um, that would be a much more controlled process. Um, also ground level support for 911-like services in the network are a few ideas. Then UEN hosts a lot of uh, online centralized resources for higher and public education in our state. Uh, we would like to use our expertise in uh, hosting learning management systems uh, to deliver media-rich content to students regardless of place or time. The LMS has to have the ability to deliver that high-rich media content that a lot of students and uh, younger kids are, are demanding. Uh, similarly, UEN is working on a project with our State Office of Education to host test items uh, for formative and summative assessments. And so one of the ideas that we're working on is trying to deliver real-time information to teachers and educators depending on those formative and summative assessments to help uh, tailor education and learning for, for students and parents. And that having been said, I think I'll turn over the rest of the time to Todd. We've been working with Utopia on a number of projects across our state, and Utopia is actually building out a lot of the infrastructure to our community institutions that UEN serves. So that having been said, Todd, would you like to? Utopia, you probably all know, it's uh, hiss and a byword at times. Uh, it's now on very good footing. Utopia represents the nation's largest municipal open access, open Ethernet system. Uh, we pass over 185,000 homes, soon to be a quarter of a million, uh, and we are, uh, we serve over that. Maybe we're past now around 70,000 homes. We have closing in on 5,000 homes that are one gig symmetrically enabled, and many of those homes are now connecting at one gig, not just enabled, but connecting one gig. And that, uh, some people ask me what the price was that, uh, the price for that was, it's well under a hundred bucks. So can you imagine what you could do with a gig symmetrical to your home? We really enjoy UEN, uh, Dev Sampson and the other group, they do 
Herculean task in Utah to educate and work with our institutions. And Utopia is critical uh, government infrastructure to work with projects like UN and GENI, and we're able to do those kinds of things this morning. Um, one of the things that we envision is working with GENI, working with uh, UEN to, to not just establish these, this infrastructure, obviously, to just the uh, anchor institutions, but make every home an anchor institution of learning. So I want to show, I'm going to skip through this because you guys don't want to hear, I'll fall asleep on me now anyway. So William, will you help me show? So one of the things that we're working with as infrastructure is also the ability to uh, do mesh overlays for first responders and for educators. Um, one thing you'll note here this morning is we, we are working, we found in Salt Lake City in a park called Pioneer Park, that when we put up video surveillance, we dropped the crime in that park by 85%. Uh, Brigham City took note of that, and it's a ubiquitously built out fiber city. And so they are installing video throughout the entire city. Now, so when you're talking about video, we're also working to create a mesh overlay with the ability for first responders to work also. Where's Mike? We got a big Mike back up there to work with first responders to do with these mesh overlays to work with sensors. So if there's an explosion or a tornado that comes through, we get immediate video uh, and sensory data coming in. You see this right now is uh, zooming in on 1080p. We are accessed in live to a police feed in West Valley, uh, Utah. Um, so let me zoom that out real quick. When people, as people put in your homes, I don't know if you have security in your home, but if somebody breaks a door jam, what does it do, really? It calls down to your center. They give you a call and say, your door jam's broke. You say, well, I'll be home in a little while, and I'll reset it. Or they may send the police out, but the police don't really want to go out. And these applications are being implemented when a zone is broke on a video at your home, it immediately notifies potentially your PDA, your, your iPad, your laptop, whatever, allows you to see the video that's going on in your home. If it's a cat, that's a different response than if it's somebody with a machete, right? And so if it's somebody with a machete, you press one, that goes to the police for immediately streaming video from your home. This is a live feed in Utah this morning. You can tell it's had a little bit of rain. Um, if we wanted to check out this, uh, the license plate here, and please excuse uh, my error. I don't know why it's not tell. Good down, William. <coughs> we'll just keep clicking it till it does. There we go. Okay, but we used to buy a license plate once. She was having coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm having a little bit of problems with the controls here, but this is a. Uh, this is on our track system, so this is a, a, a feed that West Valley City has available to them. We want to go check out who's on that backhoe <coughs> across the way, if you had somebody who could drive this better. All right, we'll manually do it. I won't zoom anymore, you get the idea. It was a 1080p camera with zoom capability. As the cities deploy this type of infrastructure over top of a very critical fiber deployment, you can see that there's a lot of applications in both mesh networks and first responders. Now, if we combine that with sensory data so that you know if there's been a hurricane, how bad the hurricane is in certain areas, uh, 
if there's been, I, I know that uh, Mike works with radar. I was talking to you last night uh, about 10 kilometers sensory, but if you are sensing every single block, and I noticed the Sims group in here yesterday, if they have, that's all right, this is the police department that was calm, but I was going to do something kind of <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they... So that gives you an idea. And we, that, that's why that infrastructure is so important, because we're able to do and work with UEN, with our first responders. We're working with uh, uh, telehealth. And, and, and the ability right now, we have the ability for a radiologist in West Valley to read films at 3 in the morning at better clarity than they can read actually at the hospital. We have the ability for a gentleman to work in his underwear in a basement in Murray and earn California wages, sorry, California, <laughs> and produce the Pirates of the Caribbean. So anyway, that's, that's a, a quick example in um, our, our partners, UEN. Thank you. Any questions for us? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and we'd like to open it up for questions. Yes. code right now you could yeah. <laughs> and, and, and are these videos like archived or, or are they like deleted every 30 days or something? We, we can archive them. Uh, we, we can do anything. It, those are live streams right there. And the only reason, I, I don't know why our, uh, typically our feeds wouldn't stutter like that so we must have a little bit of a connection that way. But it's 1080p just as, uh, the controls typically you can just basically almost with your hand is zoom in and out and see and go and pan. We were going to have, uh, we didn't think we had time this morning, we were going to arrest the mayor of West Valley online for you. I think that was done. Tommy, see if we still wanted to arrest him. But those feeds are pretty remarkable, those abilities to have those cameras. Of course, then you start worrying about how far do you go and those kinds of things. But we have the ability, first responders going into a scene to be routed via sensory and stream video. Just two quick anecdotes. In Utah, we had an F5 tornado. That might seem to most of you in the Midwest typical, but in Utah, with big mountains, we don't get that. And our police were out there with hand signals and Morse code because the telecommunications were down and they couldn't, they didn't have a way to work. Last summer, we had a huge fire on the Valley Rim, and the only way first responders could communicate was via Twitter. So these infrastructures become critical, uh, working with sensory data and video applications and redundant uh, and cell communications. Is that standard access software, or did you guys do something special? I'm just the eye candy of Utopia. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just kidding. I, I, it, it, there, it, it, this uh, software they're using is uh, something that they, I think, is proprietary. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and good morning to everybody. Uh, <laughs> pleasure to be here. And uh, so I want to uh, tell you a little bit about some of the work we are doing and sort of how it might relate to US Ignite. And I, it's kind of uh, interesting because I see, I almost thought the program is such a perfect fit for kind of things we are trying to do. Uh, and a uh, lot of what you'll see today will chime very well with what Casey spoke about yesterday. I was listening to his talk yesterday. I said, I probably don't need to give my talk. He's already done it. <laughs> But, uh, but I think there are some interesting differences. Maybe we can collaborate on a few pieces. So let me get into it. So our goal really is to look at uh, or build a system that uh, eventually will take us to uh, smart transportation. And uh, the core of that is basically providing really high bandwidth connectivity to vehicles. This, I think, is a pretty challenging problem because of bandwidth constraints, spectrum limitations, uh, uh, all the mobility issues, fading, all these things come in. So you know. How do you provide high bandwidth connectivity to vehicles is, is something that really is uh, still there's a lot of research going on, a lot of techniques being tried out, but we have made some initial progress, and I'll uh, uh, talk about that. 
So what we would like to do, and uh, we have been having lots of discussions in Wisconsin, and uh, today I'm trying to focus more on the positives in Wisconsin as opposed to the negatives we had yesterday. Uh, so this is a collaboration uh, with the university, which includes uh, my group, uh, the IT department, or the division of IT, or do it as it's called, City of Madison folks, uh, Madison Metro, which runs our public transit system in, in Madison, Van Gelder Bus Company. This is a long distance bus operator that runs uh, between Madison, Milwaukee, Chicago, Minneapolis, and sometimes it's on different charter routes. Uh, in fact, it's actually a subsidiary of Coach USA, so uh, potentially there's a much bigger network behind it. And the Dane County Emergency Medical Services. So it's all tied together and doing something interesting. Uh, so the, the problem that we are trying to focus on uh, is to basically look at applications where all, let's say, let's start with the goal of saying all city and public safety vehicles have very high bandwidth connectivity to the internet and to roadside infrastructure. So the kind of applications we are trying to go after are, uh, there are multiple different examples. So you can imagine that uh, the simplest thing you can think of is all passengers in a bus or a train or such vehicle are, you know, on a ride, sometimes it's 15, 20 minutes, sometimes it's 35, 40 minutes, and they can potentially do something useful sitting there, uh, much more than what you can do on a, on a much, uh, on your iPhone or a, on a small Android device. If you had a high bandwidth link, you could potentially get connected, you could start checking your email, and, you know, while you get, when you get to work, you probably get more productive that way. Uh, other things that I have seen in most of these bus networks is that, uh, there are security cameras uh, that are placed. In fact, uh, some of them are very elaborate. They have this uh, six cameras that are mounted on the bus, and they're taking different kinds of images. Now, most of the time, nobody cares, right? Nobody cares about those images. But uh, when something happens, people want to quickly access those images or actually the video footage and then figure out what happened. And uh, the, the, the challenge is, of course, there is no bandwidth today to kind of uh, transport all that live. And what happens is that there is this hard disk that is uh, sitting in the bus as well, and all the images get, or, or all the video footage gets stored in the hard disk. And then if something happens, somebody goes and physically pulls the hard drive and tries to copy all the files, and then somebody realizes, oh, the camera was off. So, you know, there's all kinds of issues by not having real-time access to this kind of infrastructure. And then, you know, kind of going further from there, you can imagine you know, all the interaction with the... Uh, traffic light system with the other camera system. So, you know, using that for road condition information, weather information, uh, so, sorry, I, I mean, uh, navigation information, and, and all these related um, things can provide or, or take us towards the goal of smarter transportation systems across uh, a city or even a nationwide uh, uh, scale. The second application domain, so that's kind of focusing on sort of public transport and related uh, things like that. The second domain that we are focused on is uh, providing uh, connectivity for emergency response. And uh, uh, I, I should mention uh, in the, sorry, in the previous slide um, that uh, the, the, I'll talk about the, the, the collaborations ongoing with Madison Metro and Van Gelder. The, these are, uh, we are working with both these bus operators for more than 10 months now, and there are some very interesting things that uh, we have already been able to do with them. Now, with the, with the emergency response, uh, again, uh, there are multiple different applications. The most uh, interesting one that we have started discussing with them is where we provide live connectivity uh, of an audiovisual channel between the patient who's just come into the ambulance, for example, and the hospital ER doctors. And uh, 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 if you're aware, you know, paramedics who go out with the ambulance are much less trained than a doctor. So, uh, often the doctor would feel uh, it, it's very beneficial if they can look at a patient uh, physically and uh, interact with that person. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, there's nothing better than visual cues to kind of understand uh, what's happening. And uh, at least in the Madison area, I know that uh, these ambulances tend to go far and wide, and sometimes they are probably an hour away from the hospital. And that's a pretty long ride, and if somebody has an urgent care need, you know, you want the urgent care at a... Uh, service or, or the support to start as soon as you can. So that's actually one of the things we want to enable. Um, in addition, uh, we, we were into these ambulances recently and we were looking at, uh, there are like probably six to eight different things that could really use some form of internet connectivity in the ambulance. There's an EKG system that's uh, collecting data and uh, they have ad hoc methods. So they have a way to connect maybe a cell phone for a period of time. But uh, what the folks uh, at one of the ambulance organizations told me is that the 
uh, they connect to say one of the networks and uh, the network gets disconnected or something the it goes through you know rural areas where maybe one network's only visible the other one isn't and therefore they get disconnected and things don't work all the time and it's not as reliable so uh, there is the, sometimes they have one usb stick that they probably sometimes share around a bit and kind of try to get data out and so many times they, the ambulance comes back and then they can send out all the reports download all the other information so it's very cumbersome for now so the idea that we had is basically we'll provide them with this high bandwidth router connecting to uh, various things and that provides them to be uh, to connect all these different devices into the ambulance very effectively so our plan is in the next uh, probably month we will uh, we have had interactions with our county emergency medical services which under which there are probably seven or eight different medical uh, emergency organizations and we'll start some trials with one or two of them okay so this is basically the domain i'm trying to approach now um, I'll, I'll talk about the various solution ingredients. There are many things that I think have synergistically come together over the last few years. And let me just uh, give you a sense of what the different things are. So first is, you know, uh, as you well know, the, that higher bandwidth cellular services are coming down the pipe. 4G, like WiMAX, LTE is there. It's increasingly getting feasible to deploy high bandwidth systems. Uh, if you tried 10 years back with your 2G, I don't know, 9.2 kilobits per second, you know, this would be pipe dream. and some people have tried it to some level of success, but now it's really going to get possible. Uh, second is, uh, you know, maybe some people here are familiar with Genie, uh, but uh, uh, I think, uh, I mean, Genie's, got, Genie's done um, very, you know, given us a very nice uh, infrastructure uh, to do lots of interesting things. We have, uh, you know, we are part of the Genie WiMAX deployment. And uh, we have right now installed two Genie uh, cell uh, two Genie WiMAX towers on campus. Um, they are uh, one is in our computer science building, the other is uh, relatively close to it as well, and a third tower is being planned uh, also on campus. So this will once all of them go up, we will get a reasonable campus-wide footprint uh, with WiMAX, and that gives us a certain starting point for coverage. The plan is actually to work with some of these local organizations to expand the footprint of WiMAX. So uh, Madison Metro, which is a local bus operator, uh, uh, at least one of the hospitals have, will, uh, have expressed interest in hosting some of our infrastructure as well. And if we can do that, then we have even more uh, nicer coverage across the uh, a core part of the city. We also have a downtown-wide uh, Wi-Fi mesh. So the, the second picture, the middle picture, basically shows a view of part of Madison. I would say that's about maybe uh, 20 square miles, I think. Uh, and uh, the, the part that is shaded is where uh, citywide Wi-Fi, or I would say down, it's mostly downtown and sort of expanding a little bit from there. Uh, that's covered through Wi-Fi. Uh, and, and so when the buses or any of these vehicles go through there, we can also connect to the Wi-Fi networks. And then uh, there's all these collaboration plans and uh, discussions ongoing. Some of this is already in place. Madison Metro Transit, City of Madison, and uh, various other installation sites have been planned. Uh, the other interesting activity is what's called Muffin. Muffin is a, a citywide fiber network that basically connects the university, lots of hospitals, um, uh, some other nonprofit organizations in a nice, at uh, uh, the Madison Metro actually, uh, in a nice uh, uh, connectivity. And basically, our WiMAX towers will back into these uh, fiber networks from different sites. And therefore, we will have a very quick uh, entry point into the wired side of the internet. And uh, sort of uh, going forward from here, oh, uh, the other thing is uh, uh, one of my uh, colleagues in Madison is also planning to deploy some open flow capability into this muffin network, so that might also be useful to us. Um, and then going forward, um, uh, we have planned to access new spectrum, specifically in the TV white space uh, domain. We have uh, funding to kind of uh, build out and then potentially deploy this uh, NSF, uh, uh, NSF funded uh, effort to uh, build out and deploy a white space network. So that's actually um, something that will give us more bandwidth and more interesting capabilities in the system. The other two pictures in this slide, the top one shows uh, one, of our, uh, one of our WiMAX uh, installations on top of the CS building and a view from the top. And the picture at the bottom shows sort of the uh, much larger view of Madison with uh, sort of the uh, path of the fiber network. Uh, if those of you who haven't been to Madison, you know, we have these two large lakes. These are not the Great Lakes, but you can see the other side. But uh, <laughs> if, if, uh, uh, so, you know, the downtown is sort of the peninsula between the two lakes. Uh, that's where the capital and sort of the 
university campus is close by, but the city kind of expands both east and west, and it goes pretty far. And uh, if I have the mouse here, yeah. So roughly, um, this is where the campus is. Uh, the, the, the buses go actually all over this place, you know, this entire map is covered by where the buses go. This is probably 60 square miles, I would say, or even more than that. So that's where uh, this is. Now, the next solution ingredient is basically the system that we have developed, we call it Wirover. Uh, and the, the core idea is that um, it, it's like a, a multi-network router which can aggregate and send traffic across all different cellular 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi networks. So you can connect to AT&T Sprint and Verizon, connect to our WiMAX, connect to Wi-Fi, all of these, and provide a high bandwidth view into the vehicle. So we use network diversity here, and we have been we have built a lot of different optimizations over time. Uh, we use uh, what's interesting is over time because we have deployed this on buses. As the buses have gone about their daily business on different routes, we have been able to basically benchmark the performance of many different cellular networks. So if you come to me and tell me I, I live in this place, should I get AT&T, Verizon, or Sprint, I can tell you exactly which one's better than which. Okay, That data itself might be very interesting. But the other uh, side effect of that is that we can take that information into account when we are deciding how to stripe data. And we can almost predict it because we know roughly where the bus is going. So we can do a lot of interesting things. There's some coding techniques applied and some sort of traffic prediction that we apply and things like that. That really be, be in a bunch of... Uh, uh, interesting uh, efforts over the years. Um, so it's, it's a fully software solution. That's actually a good thing. So we can be very flexible with respect to the platform. Uh, so this is basically what we are trying to put together. So we bring this system, we deploy it on these vehicles, look at sort of smart transportation applications with, you know, and, and, and sort of uh, emergency services applications. And potentially you can really uh, impact the, uh, the local community, uh, you know, say improved urgent care services with Dane County e EMS. Uh, improve public safety with this uh, city buses incident response can be much faster and uh, overall I think this would be something that directly impacts our local society so I think that'll be quite exciting uh, in terms of scale uh, and uh, you know that's what I'm trying to get towards so uh, feasibility so today we are already on multiple buses and uh, that gives us a lot of confidence because you know first time when we deployed this uh, after, uh, let's say, six hours, one of the nodes went down, and we were wondering, did the bus stop running? Did the node fail? And, uh, you know, after a while, so we kind of have iterated over time to figure out how to actually do debugging on this. Uh, in early days, I remember at least one incident where we had the ability to track the node, but the node wasn't working uh, or wasn't providing Wi-Fi service in the bus. So we actually, uh, I, we drove and kind of chased the bus to find out what happened. And you know, because we had GPS, we could track the bus and eventually get into it and reset the machine. But today things are much better. Um, we have, I think, hundreds of users on these buses already. And uh, the, the thing on the, on the right side shows a quick user survey uh, this is from just a month uh, back, and I think it's month of February, or uh, two, three months back. A uh, few hundred users responded to our online survey. This is always live, and people can go in and uh, comment on how they thought the experience was. And we have found very positive response. And of course, part of it is could be that it's free. But still, people are pretty happy with what they see, and we get lots of emails saying, you know, we really love this. Why don't you do this on more buses, right? Um, and uh, really, the longer term goal will be to make this uh, self-sustainable and make it value added so that the bus networks really, really start beginning to depend on these things. So here is some quick vi visuals of different pieces that we have. Uh, here is a view inside the bus cabinet where our node sits. It's a very small box in there. You see the two antennas. Those are the Wi-Fi antennas. There's a GPS that goes through the uh, hatch on top of the bus into the roof and things like that. Um, and then uh, uh, there are lots of visualization and other things. We can track all the vehicles that we have. Um, and here is some data. This is from late last year. Uh, this one's interesting because I, I sometimes wondered, you know, a lot of people have iPhones, a lot of people have Android phones. Do they really care about the internet on the bus? But it turns out uh, this was one ride from, I think, Madison to Minneapolis, about four hours or <coughs> four to six hours with some stops in the middle. And, uh, for this duration of time, uh, there were this was one single trip. There were 30 people who got connected to the to the network, all in the same bus, of course, right? And uh, this uh, this uh, picture on top shows uh, how long each person connected to. And as you could expect, that there's somebody who connected for the entire ride, 
and there are somebody who connect for two minutes. But it's nicely distributed, which means as people get in, get off, you know, they connect for different durations of time. The other two pictures shows how much uh, content they actually exchanged, uploads and downloads. Amazing thing was uh, the highest user, uh, I think user number 16 in this picture, or 14 in this picture, downloaded 130 megabytes in four hours. And probably, I don't know, watching video or doing something, but it's an incredible amount of uh, data that they exchange. And as, as you would expect, there are some very heavy users, some light users, people just doing Facebook updates and things like that. So there's huge amounts of activity on these vehicles today. Um, so that's where we are. So I think it's feasible. We can really scale this up. We have at least experience in doing this. Uh, metrics, again, uh, I think I liked what Mark said yesterday. It's, uh, we can give you the very low level networking metrics, but kind of the abstracted higher metrics a little bit harder. Uh, and the, the, I put question marks against these metrics because I don't know if you can even measure it and say, OK, this is exactly why we were able to save a life uh, or something like that. But uh, we could probably try to see what's the quality of response time or what kind of response time do public safety have before and after the system. Maybe that could be measured. How many users are using the system? How much usage there is? These are things that potentially can be measured and that will give us some measure of success. And then the other measure is if you eventually say, you know, we, we ran out of funding, tomorrow we're going to take down the system, how much resistance do you get from the, uh, the places where you've deployed it and are they starting to or willing to pay for it because that will really show that they really care about what this is able to do for them. Uh, so I, uh, you know, we know I already mentioned all the different partners that I uh, want to work with. Uh, all of these uh, folks have been working with us for a while. Um, an interesting thing that happened just two days before, that is the day before I got here, is uh, we entered into a business competition with the Wide Over System, and it actually won the statewide business competition. And so, uh, who knows? We might even try to commercialize this. And the the reason, the primary reason is. Uh, if we want to really scale this up to 250 or 500 buses, uh, we cannot sit in the university and manage this. We have to really be more professional about it. We need resources. We need uh, full-time people running that operation to some level. So we might go towards the directions. Uh, the other thing, this is all what I, uh, this is all what's happening in Madison. And uh, the other thing is that we had uh, some very, very preliminary discussions with folks at Chattanooga uh, over the phone uh, in the last couple of weeks. and. I'm hoping to follow up with them uh, maybe after these presentations are done today. And uh, I think there's some interesting potential for the kind of things we're doing and maybe uh, what can be done there. Uh, there is also some collaborations we've set up with Cisco. Cisco is one of the, uh, Cisco gave us one of the YMAX towers that actually we are using in our deployment. And uh, here is some local press we got, you know, we, we, we got in the front page of our, uh, the Wisconsin State Journal and uh, other local newspapers. And so uh, there's growing visibility. So I think this can really uh, potentially be very beneficial. So I think that's all I had. Thank you. Yeah. Right, so what, uh, again, uh, I've only spoken with the doctors and I've asked them if this were to be available, what could you do and how would this would be useful? And what they told me is that in certain cases, it helps them understand uh, what would be required when the patient gets to the hospital. So sometimes the, param the paramedics may think it's some something, maybe they think it's a stroke, but it's not a stroke or something like that. And by looking at some symptoms and physically interacting with the patient, they can see that much better. And therefore, they can get prepared before the patient gets in, as opposed to guessing sort of uh, what's so going on. It might be interesting to see if there's actually some instructions the doctors can give to the EMS technicians as well to do treatment on the roof. Uh, that may be another measure to help uh, support yeah. the blood. Okay, good. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, I was curious to know, when you have a good infrastructure, would you have some uh, thoughts on Nature of one can develop sure. So, you know, we are part of the Genie uh, infrastructure, so you can potentially deploy applications on top of it. Uh, there are many different thoughts we have had. Uh, so, for example, we'll have campus-wide WiMAX maybe in a few more months. Right now we have a, per a certain fraction of it. Uh, what we could do is we have been discussing with the folks at BBN that um, 
there are certain cell phones that can potentially work on this WiMAX infrastructure like the HTC Evo and things like that. So could we, you could potentially imagine building some services that give you a pretty nice footprint and maybe they're localized applications and work with our infrastructure. You can test them out in a very small but very diverse ecosystem. And the interesting thing here is, I mean, maybe not 100% of our users, but maybe even 5% of our users may own or may want to get a WiMAX compatible phone. And that still is a very large population on which you can run an experiment on. So I think uh, it's really, uh, I think the best way for me to learn about what applications we can do is, you know, I go and tell my class, you know, here is what the capability is. And I, I do this uh, mobile phone programming class and say, you know, build an application that will be of local interest. And people just amaze me in the kind of things they're able to do. So I think, uh, I think there's a lot of applications possible. Uh, I can maybe discuss offline with a few. Yeah, I'd yeah. like to talk and uh, let them follow up. But sure. I want to also mention that for the metrics, there is this problem with transfer of critical care for patients and critical catastrophe networks. And that is a very nice metric for you to plug in. We can talk now. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yes. Uh, as to network diversification, I think that's a really good strategy. When you connect to AT and T and Sprint and the other networks, uh, who pays for that? Right now, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now I do. But I think that some of these partners are willing to pick up the tab. I mean, if, for example, in medical emergency, the, the the ambulance folks would be willing to pay after they see the value. With the bus operators, probably they'll start paying at least. They'll cover the monthly charges from the coming months. But I had to demonstrate to them this is actually good. There are, you know, they get hundreds of emails from their passengers, so my burden has lessened a lot trying to convince them this is good for you. So. And if you would like additional test beds, we'd we'll be happy to provide some. Sure, I would love to, yeah, talk about that. Thank you. <coughs> Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, have you put this on a Lifestar helicopter? No, uh, we haven't. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, that would be interesting. I think we're just trying to take the baby steps right now. Uh, but you're right, I mean, it could go on helicopters, and I, I, I don't know how connectivity would work from there for cellular networks, but, uh, I mean, of course, there is things like uh, GoGo in flight, which uh, you connect with uh, a different network, and maybe that's uh, another strategy. Well, I live rural, and there's a lot of times that the local hospital sends livestock. Really right, right. So, in fact, our, our, our campus, our hospital also has uh, at least one, maybe two helicopters that seem to go in and out. And definitely, that's a that's a potential. Emirates allows cell phone on the flight. Sorry. Emirates allows cell phone on the flight, right? So right. Sure. Well, but uh, there is, of course, internet services on flights already. So I think it's clearly proven right. that it works. <coughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so welcome to Jurassic Park. I'm here to show you how we make dinosaurs. Now that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about this morning, but I sure wish I would have thought of that for the filming for last night. Um, at any rate, uh, we have the Case Connection Zone, 100 residences, uh, all wired with bi-directional uh, gigabit fiber to the home. It's just a couple blocks that way. and. Um, what we're doing, as key to everything else, our underlying uh, technology is video. One of our medical school researchers, Susan Wentz, says that what we're really doing is we're putting back the people-to-people -people connections that our technology and our medical delivery system in particular have taken out of our society. I really like that. And while we are in a, a kind of a nice community right here, our next beta blocks are going to be in the underserved communities around the university, communities where people are afraid to go out of their homes in the evenings. Um, Kurt Stenge, who just walked in, taught me that Wendell Berry says that measure of health is an individual's connection with the community. And if we're in these communities where we have broken that connection, we're affecting much more than uh, is just immediately apparent. 
we want to put it back with video. And so what we need is uh, ubiquitous ability to have multi-point video conferencing. It's important to all of our communities. Currently, we're using a really nice system from Radvision called Scopia Desktop, but it's limited. All, everything runs through uh, a Scopia bridge, which I have written on here as a, a multi-point control unit, or MCU. Um, the MCU itself is a limiting factor in everything we're doing. It controls the bandwidth we can get between any of the endpoints and the unit. It controls the number of sessions we can get. It controls the resolution we can get. And it chooses the protocols that are in use. So we have, with this, a limited number of uh, sessions. We have limited access. We have to somehow give everyone access to a session. And that's handled by an administrator. Uh, for some reason, Case Human Resources only allows us uh, a limited number of administrators. Um, it, the whole system is just limited. It is not scalable. The dedicated client software in the MCU, uh, as I said, it limits the quality, the resolution that we can get, and it limits the bandwidth we can use. If you saw the last demo last night with our uh, a patient spelling out the name on a pill bottle, we tried to hold that pill bottle up to the camera at the highest resolution setting we can get over the video, and that pill bottle could not be read by the physician. He could read the patient's name, but the smaller text below it, he couldn't get. Um, we need that kind of resolution for some of the things we're working on. Um, the MCU itself is very compute intensive. There's lots of processors in there doing lots of computing. Uh, so it's basically decoding the video it's receiving from each of the clients, reformatting it, assembling it into a new frame, and then encoding that frame and sending it back to all of the clients. Um, so the MCUs are expensive. To double the one that we have right now would cost about $75,000, uh, and that's not that many sessions. Um, and they're risky. If they fail, nobody has a video conference. So it's not scalable to the larger community, and we want to go into underserved communities where our residents won't have money to be buying many of the things that we want to supply. So uh, it's expensive to administer. Somebody has to maintain and upgrade it. And uh, we have had several upgrades, all of which have to be handled by people who know what they're doing. Um, so what's our solution to this? What I'd like to see is some free, open source, uh, high definition, high bandwidth video conferencing software. And what I've shown in this diagram is a master client with a uh, wider path to the network than each of the individual clients. It's not really a wider path, it's just using more bandwidth. We want to distribute the MCU functions to the clients. So I told you that it was largely compute limited. What I'd like to do is to set up a uh, uh, control protocol similar to SIP, which instructs each of the clients to provide video in a particular format. So it's already pre-formatted. It's sent through the network to the master client, and there can be one master client per conference, any number of conferences. So if this software completely removes the scalability problem, it can be set up anywhere in the network, ad hoc for users group. Okay, the master client receives all these individual videos. It bundles them into a multi-track video stream. It includes uh, somehow the frame that this will be presented in, perhaps HTML5, and sends all of this back to each of the individual clients. Um, and during the conference, you may change the framing. Um, one of the nice things with the conferencing system we use right now is that the person speaking appears larger than the others participating in, in the conference. I, uh, I guess there's nobody in here so young that I can't talk about a Hollywood Squares view of, uh, of the conference. That's what we think of, but the speaking square becomes larger than the others. Um, 
we're using this for classes with high school students. Uh, we want to, uh, right now, we're, we're connecting high school students with tutors, uh, college students. Uh, there's a dream to have the high school students actually tutor um, elementary school students and extend this whole spectrum through intergenerational learning as one of the projects uh, in our case connection zone. All of it depends on video and uh, we want to be able to freely distribute that video. Um, so the clients, they unbundle and decode each track and then present it in the frame that the uh, master client has specified. Uh, we've worked with that unbundling before. In our medical simulation center here, we uh, often take videos from multiple angles of a uh, student clinician and a standardized patient interacting. Uh, and when we play it back for debriefing, we take two separate videos, play them back, uh, so they're decoded separately, they're presented together, and the syncing and everything else works just beautifully. Um, so the impact, importance, and novelty. Well, the first thing is that the system will be adaptive in that it will begin by measuring the available bandwidth between the client and the master, and it will also have the uh, client report its compute capabilities. So when the master makes a request, um, the request will be within the uh, potential of the client and the network uh, connection between them. Um, we're hoping to push this to th beyond 1080p, beyond HD video, to 3K, I'm sorry, to 3D, 4K, and even holographic video. And in medicine, for example, 3D becomes important. We want to be able to show depths of certain lesions or be able to move things and watch in 3D. It becomes very important for uh, dermatologists, orthopedists, various uh, specialties that might be able to have video interactions with patients. Um, the control protocol is not going to have the type of encoding built into it so that the control protocol will uh, accommodate current and future codecs over a range of bandwidths um, and one of the cases will be completely um, uncompressed video. We're interested in being able to have student uh, musicians in our high schools, the really accomplished ones, able to practice with members of the Cleveland Orchestra, with the Cleveland Orchestra in Severance Hall, right down the street here, uh, their home uh, theater, uh, their home concert hall, and the students in their high schools, and perhaps students in several high schools. Well, if you try to use video compression, the delay in the video compression makes it impossible to synchronize the audio. But as you saw last night, it is possible, if it's done just right, and that means uncompressed video, to bring everything into sync. Um, we want this free. It's very important to what we want to do. We want everyone to have access to it within the community. And we believe that this is a platform app, platform capability for many of the things we want to do with a high bandwidth network. Uh, finally, um, any group of two or more people with this, um, with this software will be able to establish their own multipoint video conference. Another function of the master in this regard is to determine who can join the video conference and that's rather necessary to keep it that way even when we take some of the next steps which are uh, uh, interesting. Um, Heidi brought to my attention a project called NetServe in which there are routers which have dynamic services loaded into them. Well with some of these services we could run full bandwidth video into these routers and let the routers worry about the encoding, the reformatting, any one of a number of interesting things so that we could have a range of different clients and we could have video formatted the best possible way from that client ranging from a video wall uh, to a, uh, uh, an iPhone or an Android phone down in the bottom right, tablets, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, desktop clients. So that's where we're going. Um, we have uh, 
as I said, ad hoc groups of clients that can create their own conferences. Um, we can have people advertise conferences on websites or wherever they like. Uh, I am not in this project worried about any kind of a directory uh, for the, the masters. They can appear as needed. Um, we're leveraging open source uh, and standards in this. So I'm considering SIP, HTML5, various standard codecs. Um, the sad thing is that there are no standard video co codecs accepted across every browser for HTML5, but we'll pick a subset. Um, the NetServe routers can offload. Uh, they can serve as reflectors so that the client stream here, deliberately drawn narrower, doesn't have to hit every one of the clients. The master client doesn't have to hit every one of the clients. It can hit a router which serves as a reflector. It can enable older endpoints. So as we go into the underserved communities, it becomes very important to be able to take older endpoints, older computers, and let them do the encoding and communication they need to do. And possibly, um, as I show here, the client can specify the presentation framework, and it can be ideally formatted for whatever the client is. We have a, a team put together, uh, partially. We're looking for additional people. Uh, as early as this morning, we were working for looking for additional people. So uh, we have people in the video area, and then excellent people in the networking and measurement and monitoring area uh, as part of the team already. But anyone interested, we are very interested in talking to you. So that's it. Thank you. for doing this, but most insurers, many insurers aren't routinely reimbursing them. The two lever points right now are the patient-centered medical home demonstration projects. We have one here in Ohio and one in Northeast Ohio as well, where you're getting multiple payers coming together um, to, uh, to, try to, re to try to pay for primary care in a way that's not just dependent on the visit, but it's dependent on trying to provide care for a population. So that's one important lever point. Another are closed panel HMOs where they are more self-insured uh, things like large employers where you're not just reimbursing for the business, but you're saying, what are we doing that's providing value? Yes. Clearly something like this where you don't have to take time off from work, where you don't have to have a, a homebound elderly person try to come in with all sorts of uh, dangerous transportation that, that works. The, the, the final one that's at a, a higher level is the Center for Medicare and Medicare, Medicaid Services, CMS, has a, a, an innovation center that was part of the, the health care reform law that is really looking for uh, innovations that, that relate to reimbursement. And so that, so doing a demonstration project that could well be at the state level would be kind of a home run way to do this. And if those things work, they, they, the law gives the Secretary of Health and Human Services the power to take those uh, demonstrations that have worked and make that part of the, the statutes nationally. So I think there's work to be done on a regional level around the patient center medical home uh, is, is the biggest level point, particularly the multi care ones. And then the, the home run is at the, the national level around the CMS uh, demonstration. Thank you. We're doing uh, another, another thrust in that regard, which is we're trying to work with the VA, uh, where the VA self insurance for its medical costs. And they're a natural because they'll measure it and tell you the bottom line impact of what these technologies do. So that's just another way of trying to get at the same measure. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, I wanted to take
take one second to tell everyone that our Alpha House, our demo for uh, many of the things we're doing in the Beta Block, is open from 12:45 to 2. Following today's conference, it's basically a block down the street this way, and then like the second or third house to the right. It's called the Coffee House. Just come upstairs. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I had lots of time in the airport yesterday as I was trying to get to Chicago, so I had the opportunity to revise my slides a little bit. <laughs> so the challenge that we're going to address is how to keep older adults healthy and independent so that they can age in the home of their choice. This is, in fact, uh, you know, what they call aging in place. And our proposed solution is a, a really a continuation of what we've been doing uh, using passive sensing in the home to recognize early signs of illness and functional decline. And that coupled then with nursing care coordination, in this case it would be delivered remotely through high-speed networking. And the idea that, that this would then lead to early interventions and ultimately better health. So I presented this uh, in the May workshop. Some of you may recall, uh, this is what Don Detmer calls squaring the life curve. This really addresses the impact of this work. We have the traditional uh, trajectory of functional decline that's, uh, that's uh, designated by this stair-step uh, curve in red. We're trying to change that to a more squared curve like the, the one in green. The idea is to be able to recognize what's a typical pattern of activity for a particular individual and then recognize when that pattern changes and that oftentimes coincides with these early signs of, of illness and functional decline. And we've seen some interesting examples of that in the current work that we're doing. So for the proposed project, we're going to pare that down a little bit. and. Uh, uh, take away the, uh, the gate uh, aspect of it so we have a smaller sensor uh, pattern, smaller se sensor set, but it still boils down to being able to assess what are typical pa behavioral patterns for an individual, recognizing when those patterns change and then using that as a means of detecting early signs of health decline. So the current project that we've been running in Tiger Place looks like this. We have a, uh, a current NIH-funded study that's been doing this using motion. Uh, most of the sensors that have turned out to be the best are, are motion sensors and bed sensors. We also deploy the bed sensor in the chair, and the bed sensor gives you a qualitative pulse and respiration, low, normal, and high pulse and respiration, as well as bed restlessness. So it captures uh, a nice sense of, of things that coincide with health changes. And the motion sensors are used in all kinds of ways, including capturing a general level of activity for an individual, uh, which we've seen also coincides with some interesting health changes. Right now, the way that this is done in Tiger Place, our elder care facility in Columbia, Missouri, is using local nursing care but we've been able to find in, a, this, in this NIH funded study, as a prospective study, that after six months, we've seen better health outcomes in the test group compared to those of the control group. Now that's a relatively small study. We've got 21 residents in the test group and 20 residents in the control group, but still to be able to show statistically significant differences in health outcomes after six months, I think is a pretty dramatic outcome. So um, what we're proposing to do then <coughs> is to extend this out to be able to serve people that are not just in Tiger Place, uh, people that are, would be in their homes or, or located remotely, and use video conferencing with high-speed networking to perform that uh, nursing care coordination effort. So 
this would give us a nice way of kind of <coughs> leveraging what we've already been doing uh, in terms of using the same kind of sensor set. And we have this set up right now where we're able to generate alerts in real time. These alerts are actually emailed to the clinician staff. And included with this email alert, which, which tells you what parameter is, uh, is in question, we also include a link to a website which lets them pop up the interface, it lets them see what the sensor data looks like within the context of what's going on uh, for that particular individual. And then we also are having them uh, click on another link which allows them to rate the clinical relevance of that alert. And so we've been able now to build a database of potential alerts, and we know uh, according to the clinician ratings, what constitutes a good alert in a clinical sense versus a poor alert. And we're using that then to refine the alert algorithm so that we can get closer to achieving these uh, more real-time um, effective <coughs> alerts. And so some of the things that we've been able to identify so far are things like urinary tract infections that we've been able to see much earlier than would be caught using traditional healthcare methods. Also, uh, congestive heart failure, you know, cardiac problems, and we've seen the sensor patterns change pretty dramatically with various types of conditions, including rehabilitation conditions. So, how to measure success? I had some uh, discussions with some of our clinical partners on on how we could do this in the short term in a one-year project. We would love to be able to measure health outcomes, to actually run a controlled study as we're doing in Tiger Place. But we decided in a short-term one-year project that it really wasn't very feasible for us to do that. But what we could do as an alternative is to test the general acceptance of this approach. And so there's a, a human factors model that one of my colleagues has been working on uh, with regards to healthcare delivery that, that uses uh, effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction types of measures. And we could test the usability of this, uh, this approach as a system, which really answers some of these questions, how do nurses and elderly residents, and perhaps we also extend this to their family members, how do their family members feel uh, that they're that their elderly um, residents, parents or grandparents um, are getting care? Do they feel like this is a, a good quality of care that's being received? And so we've, we've used this in the past with some other studies to try and get at this general idea. And then once that was done, we would love to extend it into a, a scaled up version where we're really doing um, a more uh, uh, controlled study larger numbers of people for larger periods of time. And we have a lot of, of uh, experience now in being able to measure different kinds of health outcomes. And so we really could measure, on, in a larger scale study, we really could measure health outcomes and see whether those indeed would change. So uh, in terms of partner cities, We've had some discussions with some folks in the Kansas City area. You know, they're rel relatively close to us, and so logistically speaking, this would be much easier for us to deal with. Um, we've had, in particular, uh, partnered with the, the company called Home for Life Solutions, which is connected with John Knox Village. And so that would be a, a good short-term solution to use the already trained and experienced clinicians at MU and have them interact with the Kansas City residents. I've also had some discussions uh, with Kurt Staney at, in Cleveland, and uh, you know we'd love to, to talk more about whether we could do a study with them involving some of the residents in Cleveland. Um, I think that this would be a tremendous impact if we could do a, some kind of a study with rural residents. And so I'd love to do a study in rural Missouri, and, and I understand that, that there is a, so an effort in place to bring high-speed networking to a number of the smaller cities in Missouri. Um, I, I was not able to find out what the time frame of that was, but, but I think we would find some really tremendous uh, impacts 
if we could bring it to a rural community that, that really does have a very difficult problem you know, getting good uh, ongoing health care. So that's, uh, that's the end of my discussion. I was trying to keep it short, so questions and discussion. And, and I'll go back to this picture. That might be helpful. OK, questions for Mark? Well, we didn't address, I mean, I didn't address in my presentation the, um, the actual video conferencing portion of this. Um, perhaps we ought to get together with Marv and see what we could do for that part of it. We, we would welcome it. Um, do you have to customize some of the sensors for the study or do you actually have to well, so what we're using right now for the sensors are uh, a standard off-the-shelf <coughs> motion sensor. It's a passive IR motion sensor that's the same type of thing that you would find for a surveillance or a security systems. So um, we're, we're actually in the process of developing our own because there are some limitations to this, but in fact this is what we've had deployed in Tiger Place and we've been able to get some interesting data with that. You know, we process that that data in a lot of different ways, including processing it as a density. Those sensors, the passive IR sensors, deliver an event every seven seconds if there's continuous motion in the environment. And so we found that we can actually use that as a means of leveling, uh, measuring the level of activity. If you have a person that's sitting very, uh, you know, very quietly watching television or um, Reading, reading a book or something, their density that they end up generating is a very low density if you look at the number of sensor hits over time. Compared to someone who's very active, moving around a lot, you get a much higher density. Uh, in fact, I have, I did include some, oh, I didn't include, sorry, I guess it's not here. I, I have some other, I, I, can, I can show you offline if you're interested in seeing some of the, um, the kind of data we get from that. The bed sensor is a, a sensor that um, it's actually a pneumatic pad that lies on top of the mattress that captures, as I said, qualitative pulse and respiration. That's what we've been using. And we also put that on the chair. Um, we have, in fact, been developing our own bed sensor as well that would capture quantitative pulse and respiration. So if that were available in time, we would probably deploy our new bed sensor. If not, we would deploy the old one. Yeah, Kurt had a question. So, so everybody searches their own control, and you're really looking at their daily patterns and then deviations from that? Yes, that's right. We have developed uh, uh, some algorithms that have a moving baseline, and based on that moving baseline, then we compare, and, and this is done on a 24-hour day basis. We also do it on a daytime uh, basis and on a nighttime basis. So I think the daytime hours are something like um, uh, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and the nighttime hours are midnight to 6 a.m., and then the 24 hours is just midnight to midnight. And we've We've been tweaking this together with feedback from the clinicians to be able to find some kind of a scheme that seems to work. And we spent a lot of time working on the interface that lets the clinicians actually see the sensor data. We're now actually on our third iteration of that system. But I think we finally got it to the point where people seem to be pretty happy with it. Uh, so, so as I said, because we're doing this feedback with the clinicians, We've developed now this database. I mean, we've been building this database of what constitutes a good clinically relevant alert. And we're using that to refine those alerts. The initial alert algorithm was pretty simplistic and fairly loose because we purposely wanted to generate more alerts rather than fewer so that we would have the ability to, to generate this database. Yeah, M Mark had a question. Well, I was curious, first of all, how you detect UTI early. What, what is it? Is it an indirect detection, or are you 
actually measured something. Now these, um, I want to be clear about this, we're not actually diagnosing these conditions. What we're doing is we're generating alerts that show that there's been some kind of a change. And then we rely on the clinicians to go in and take a further look at what exactly is going on. So in the, ter in the, uh, in the term of the, uh, in the, I mean in the case of the UTIs, one of the things that they look at is bathroom usage. And uh, especially <coughs> nighttime bathroom usage. And so we have um, an algorithm that determines these bathroom visits and it's a little bit complicated because in Tiger Place you have to go through the bathroom to get to the closet so we had to figure out a way to filter out the closet visits so that it's, yes, we think they're really just going to use the bathroom. Um, but we, um, we have a method of counting those and so that becomes one of the parameters that we're looking at. And then we also have a visualization that actually shows the bathroom visits and in the one case, in fact, we're going to be presenting a paper at the HealthCom conference next week, which shows one example of a UTI. And if I, um, I could show you this offline if you wanted to see the, the display that actually shows this particular individual uh, did not have a pattern of using the bathroom in the middle of the night and then suddenly developed a pattern of, develop, of using the bathroom in the middle of the night and show it's, qu it's quite stark to see that. And so that's one of the things that was used as a parameter. I think in that case there were some other parameters that generated alerts as well. So you're using behavior changes as an indication that something may be wrong. Yes, that's right. That's right. And, and so it's not, it's not a standalone diagnosis system, but it's more used as an assistive device to help the clinicians. And are you working with both ambulatory and non-ambulatory patients? The, the people in Tiger Place um, are perhaps a little bit more functionally capable than what you would find in, certainly in a skilled nursing home. It might be more similar to what you would find in an assisted living facility. But there are a number of people that use wheelchairs. Uh, certainly there's lots of walkers and canes and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it's kind of a range. Yes. Have you thought about um, trying to assess cognitive decline by having, see how well they do, you know, how long it takes them to solve a Sudoku or what their angry bird score is or some other kind of um, yeah. interactive activity? Well, there's a group at the Oregon Health and Science University, Jeff Kay's group, that's been looking at uh, cognitive function decline. We have not looked at that ourselves, but certainly that thing that could be done, and, and you could look at how um, how somebody uses uh, the computers would be the easiest thing. I think this is what Jeff's group is doing. Um, but there are other things that show up. So, for instance, I have some really interesting examples of depression. You can see very stark changes in patterns that show up for people that have depression, and and uh, and, and the cognitive. Um, function shows up oftentimes as an irregular lifestyle, re re irregular pattern of, of lifestyle. And so I have an example of that too of an individual that, um, you know, un in contrast to our, our healthier residents that go to bed at the same time every night, they wake up at the same time every morning, they have the same sort of level of density in the morning as they're getting ready to go out. Uh, we have uh, some examples where we've, we've got this one individual in particular that went to bed at, at, at varying times, you know, didn't wake up at the same time, was sort of was up at all, all hours of the night, would leave the apartment in the middle of the night. And it's that sort of irregularity in the patterns that could oftentimes coincide with cognitive problems. So we would pick it up with that. And in fact, that uses just the motion sensors and being able to look at how they move around. Um, I, we've seen some interesting changes that relate to when they leave their apartment. And so uh, I was going to look at that as another study. If we just looked at their patterns of when they leave the apartment, we would get some interesting changes that I think that coincide to health problems. 
what, one of the things in taking care of older people is that specific diseases often present in a really non-specific way. So urinary tract infection, you go to the bathroom more, but you just try to acting differently. And, and so clinically, just a general sense the patient's doing something different is not doing well is really helpful. So even if you can't come up with something specific, just as an initial <coughs> screen, a change in activity and pattern for older people is very useful. So I, I think it has I think it has really a lot of implications. Yeah, you know, we've gone back and used this technique with our early illness alerts to process some of the older data. And there was one individual that had an ER visit and a hospitalization. And we, when we went back and processed um, the bed sensor data on her, we actually would have generated an alert 40 days before that ER <coughs> visit. I was amazed that the sensor data would have picked it up that, that early, but that's what it was. 40 days before the ER visit, something was going on with her bed sensor data that picked up a change. Okay, thank you for question. So um, how do you control for just the increased uh, social interaction that they would get through video chatting with their nurse, practitioner, doctor, against the group that doesn't talk to them, you know, it's less interaction, just the extra talking to might help people be healthier, regardless of any detection of problems. So you're talking about if we did this as a real controlled group. Yeah. Well, I, I would assume that, uh, well, so let me back up. The way we're doing this in Tiger Place with the local nursing cares, I mean, these people all get some kind of regular nursing care. Uh, in fact, I mean, the nurse, the staff there is very attentive in, you know, many ways. And so the only thing that's different is the fact that the nursing staff is receiving early illness alerts on those particular individuals. So what we would have to do in, in a study like this is that I would assume that these people would have some level of base care. I mean, we're not going to, you know, neglect them and throw away what they've already got. So they would have some level of care that we would just be adding on to this, this early illness alert um, mechanism, and when something comes up that indicates that there's a problem, then we would use the video conferencing to, um, to address and, and, and find out a little bit more detail about what's going on. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So I think that we're finally at the end of our set of presentations. Um, and I have to tell you that I'm absolutely blown away by how far we have come so quickly. I mean, I heard people saying, no, I got this idea at the May 16th uh, brainstorming session, and then I talked to people, and we're already scoping out a project, and this is what we're doing. Um, so fabulous number of projects. Uh, everyone's going in the right direction. I'm really, really happy with what I'm seeing. Um, so please keep charging ahead, um, pulling in more partners, doing all the things that I heard you saying, that you were looking for other people for particular roles that you needed to fill. Uh, please keep going forward. Um, there probably will be another workshop um, in August. Uh, or September, where we will try to kind of finalize kind of what these projects are going to look like. Um, so I'm going to talk more about that at the end of the day. There's a closing session at 11.30 right here. And so, um, so I'll be talking more about that then. Um, so I want people to look at the schedule. We're just going to change it slightly. Um, I think it's time for us to take a break. Um, but I'd like it to be a 10-minute break if we could, and then we're going to come back, and, um, and Chip is going to moderate the next session, but we're going to start with Glenn Reichart, uh, who's going to talk about what it means to be genie enabled what it means to have layer two connectivity. So we've been focusing so far on broadband, which is good, getting it into anchor institutions, how we evaluate all of that, all to the good, but in fact, we have another set of opportunities um, if your cities become genie enabled and we can connect them. Uh, lots of new, new ways to think, and so we're going to talk about that for a little bit. Um, and then we want to surface some of the challenges 
uh, that different stakeholders might be feeling from the city perspective, from the Genie Project Office perspective, from the researcher perspective. Uh, and I know there'll be tons of those, but I'd like to surface those um, so that we can begin um, back at NSF and OSTP to think, you know, what do we have to do in the next couple of months to kind of help you with your challenges? Okay, so let's take a quick break. If you would, try to be back here by 10.30. Uh,